right. Good morning. How are you doing? We good? Whose brackets got busted up? Everybody? Anybody got, anybody got final four teams still in? Anybody? Okay, nobody's lying either. That's good. I was just <laughs> testing you. Like who? I had Kansas. Okay. I got Texas. I, I got Texas still in it. Um, but everything's blown up. But hey, we know this. Lake Highlands Wildcats won state. We know that. Come on. They're going to win it again next year too, but that's another thing. Hey, before I dive in, um, it's so good to be with y'all today. Uh, on a personal note, a couple of things. Uh, well, first of all, Rodney was talking about our crew. Um, we were FaceTiming them this morning. They're up in the Himalaya Mountains. You can't see this, but they're up in the Himalaya Mountains. These guys are showing right about now, as we were praying, they're showing the Jesus film to people who've never heard the gospel before. Never seen the film. I've, I've experienced this before. They will start weeping and wailing when Jesus dies. Like, no! And then he's resurrected and they'll go crazy. And we kind of come here and just go, he's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. They're, gonna, they're hearing the gospel and come into Christ up in the Himalaya mountains. And it is the message that keeps on rescuing all of us. And it's the message we have today. We always are seeking to just preach that and apply it to our lives. On a personal note, here it is. Um, yesterday, uh, my son, Travis, no, actually his wife, Kate, did all the work. We have a new granddaughter in our family. Her name is Charlotte. Yeah, Charlotte Grace Warren was born yesterday. So we're, yeah, we're so thrilled. Um, I may have pictures if you want to see them. So, uh, we'll, you know, we're going to go see. She's like, I mean, just brand new. We saw her yesterday, and we just praise God for what he's doing in our lives. Um, we're going to end our service day in a really special way. You can see the board over here. You're like, what's up with that? I'm going to challenge you with something. We're going to really proclaim, allow Jesus to say who we are. Our premise has been from the very start of the year, we entered into this I am, you know, statements of Jesus. And now we're in, as, as Rodney noted, we're now we're in the trials of Jesus, trials, hearings, you know, I've got some attorneys in the room. Um, it, you know, it's a different kind of judicial system, but they've moved from now the Jews who are now going to, going to bring him before Pilate. Now the Romans, because the Romans are the ones who can put him to death. They're the only ones that can legally bring the death penalty. Let's start with the mass confession today um, for all of us. How many of you have ever received a speeding ticket? Anybody like me? Like I, a lot. Like I have, I've had many, um, but not recently. I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. Um, how many of you have ever had like a, a traffic violation? Like you did, you ran the stop sign. You didn't fully stop. You turned when you shouldn't have, you parked where you shouldn't have. Anybody, we've done this as well, okay? Some of you got multiple violations, right? Um, so how many of you like me, and I'm looking, I'm seeing some of my attorney friends here. How many of you have like me imagined yourself like in a John Gresham novel or something, like, you, like you're advocating for yourself in the courtroom? Or, or maybe you've played this out in your mind, like if I could talk to that judge, I mean, because here's what really happened. You know, like I, he had me going 68. I, I was going 65 in the 35. I was not going, you know, I mean, we always want to advocate for ourselves, right? Or, you know, that wasn't, I actually did stop. And, or that guy, he was, I had nowhere to go. And we, you know, I've imagined that, right? In certain cases. Um, now maybe you've never, you know, we have some litigators in the room. You do this all the time, but maybe you've never done that in a courtroom. But we do it all the time in our lives. And I want you to think about this with me for a moment. We do it in our relationships, right? I mean, Stacy and I, full disclosure, this week, um, like she, she's, she said something just real simple. We're, we're alone, we're at home. And I, I got a little defensive. Like, pff, really? Like, that's not what? And then she's like, that's not what I meant. Why are you so upset? Why did you, you took it wrong. Anybody else? Like we do this all the time. You, you've probably done this uh, in your work, right? Like I should have that job. Or you get a you know, job, a performance review. Like, no, 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 no. I, I did that. I should have that position. Or maybe some of us, I should be the one dating that person. I'm worthy. I should be the one getting married or having children. Or we do it all the time, don't we? 
constantly advocating. Here's the thing. Fallen people, all of us, are natural self-advocators. It's what we do. All way, and it goes way back to the garden. Remember, like Adam is like, um, God, what have you done? The woman, the, the woman you gave me. Like, I know, not me. And then what does Eve do? Uh, the serpent. And we've done it ever since. We're constantly trying to justify ourselves. That's the biblical word. I mean, think about this. What is the heart? I'm going to dive deep right away. What is that the heart of sin in our lives? What is that the core of it all? If we thought about it enough, talked about it together, we might come, you've heard this said, pride is at the heart of sin, right? It's the core of sin. I've heard it said that sin and pride both have the letter I right in the middle. I can do this. I will do this. I can validate myself. I will justify myself. I will be righteous enough. Here's the thing. This hit me this week. Self-justification is the sin. Seeking to justify. That, this is no small thing. That will keep you from salvation. Self-righteousness leads to a self-salvation of some sort. What does it mean to become a Christian? It means that you confess, I, I, I can't defend myself. I need rescue. I can't justify myself. Not before a holy God, right? I mean, this is right at the heart of what it is to be a Christian and to live the Christian life. And so, uh, with all these things, I know you're thinking about a lot of things before you step in here, but I now want us to to turn to John chapter 18, okay? You've got your Bible with you, gang. I hope that you're reading scripture every day. It's what we do. We need the truth of God in our hearts and in our lives because what I want us to do is, is, is dive into this, um, this thing. I mean, if we're, if we're really honest, if, you, if you're really honest, don't you constantly find yourself arguing your case? And again, there's not just attorneys in the room who you know, stay in litigation mode when you get home with your spouse and you're you know, arguing your case all the time. We all do this. We, we are all seeking to justify ourselves. And wouldn't it be something if you could be set free from constantly trying to defend yourself, constantly trying to be good enough, constantly trying to put uh, you know, social media, whatever else, look at me, I'm living my best life. That is a form of self-righteousness. I'm validating my existence here. I'm not going to show you all the garbage in my life, but I am something, and I want you to know it. We all do it all the time. What if we could be set free from that? Now, I'm here to tell you, as much of a fantasy as that feels like for some of us, that can happen. You can live w with freedom, but do you ever feel like in your, if, if we're honest today, if I could get inside your head, you're constantly thinking, I got to show myself, you know, right. I, I got to be right. I've got to show my, my best self. I don't want them to see this. I'm, we talked about the secrets. I'm going to hide out because I can't show everybody who I really am. I can't confess my sin. I'm not going to do that. Do you ever feel like you are powerless to defend yourself against maybe almighty God or against, you know, and from people in your life? I think we all have felt that. What in the world does Jesus' resurrection, his death on the cross and resurrection have to do with us in our powerless state that we find ourselves in? In John 18, we're going to find it. Again, the premise of this whole series has been that Jesus, uh, not only did he suffer and die ultimately on the cross for us, but he suffered for us. He was our substitute all the way to the cross. And, and now we're looking at how this plays out. And today you're going to see that in him, we are defended from accusation. We are defended from condemnation and we are defended from deception. Praise be to God. Because it all starts, watch this. We need an advocate. That's the word. We need an advocate against self-accusation more than anything. Self-condemnation, self-deception. We start believing lies and then we start to live lies. And we're all doing it. And I pray that God's spirit will speak to your heart and, and really uh, convict us. And we're going to end with a really special uh, moment for all of us before the Lord. Look at verse 28. Here we go. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas. Okay, so we've seen the three Jewish trials, if you've been with us. Now they're going to move over to the governor's house. This is uh, headquarters. This is Pilate. It's early in the morning. He's been up all night. And remember, Jesus now has already been beaten. 
Like, I mean, fist to face over and over again. He's been up all night. He's already just beat down. Pilate is finally seeing Jesus who, you know, he's going to claim, he's heard he's a king or claims to be a king. He is, he is, looks like anything but a king right now. They themselves did not enter. That's the um, Sanhedrin, the governor's headquarters, so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. The irony of ironies on full display, this hypocrisy is undeniable. Sinful men trying to convict a sinless savior will not go into a sinful man's headquarters because they don't want to defile themselves. That's self-righteousness. And before, you know, we throw rocks at the Pharisees all the time, but listen, we do the same. Maybe not as blatant, but how about this? We won't enter into certain places or enter into a relationship with certain people. Maybe we're quick to not talk to someone because they don't look like us. They don't have the same color skin we have. We, we, we don't, we don't want to get too, it gets messy to help people. Right? Like if I enter into conversation, oh, it's going to be, then I'm going to be, I'm going to be caught in and I'm going to be the one that will have to, we, we, we all do this. We avoid certain people. That is a form of self-righteousness. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm okay. I, I don't need that. Right? But it's why what Rodney said, it's why we go to places like, you know, South Texas, it's why we go across the room here. It's why we serve others in our neighborhood and people in our workplace. It's why, y'all, today on this stage, Rolando Aguirre is going to be preaching 1230, and, and, and it's going to be broadcast to um, Bachman Lake, another site, another um, place where we have Bible study, and to Vickery, where we have live worship every Sunday. And he's going to be preaching because we want to take the gospel into dark places and to people who are in need. And that's all of us. You see, Jesus had no patience, you know this, for people who would not reach out to those who are hurting. And, and this is why, because we've been changed by his grace, that we love all people here. If you're new, you need to know this. I know we look really white um, but we, and we're not all white, and we, praise be to God, we are here a church that loves all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, where you're from, your nationality, gender, of course, your religion. Everybody's welcome here. Everybody, because the grace of God has changed us, and we want you to be a part of our family. It's why we go to Southeast Asia. It's why we go to South Dallas. It's why we go to South Texas. It's why we're serving, because he's called us to be those people. We're not afraid of getting messy, right, where we can't take the Passover, because we know that our righteousness has been confirmed by Jesus. Look at verse 29. So Pilate went outside to them, and said, what accusation, there's the word, do you bring against him? He's looking for an official accusation. What is it? Now, we know a lot more about Pilate than uh, through extra biblical material. Philo, historian uh, Josephus, wrote a lot about him. In fact, Philo writes this. He says he was inflexible, stubborn, and cruel. And Josephus confirms this. He is ruthless. He didn't give a rip about the Jews. He didn't even know much about about them. Uh, this guy, he, he lived in Caesarea Martima, uh, Martima where, where you go, when you go on these tours, we did in the fall, you go to his place on the Mediterranean. Now he's just, he's not even happy that he's even in Jerusalem. He wants to be chilling by the Mediterranean at his palace, but he, by Rome's demand, he has to be in Jerusalem during the big uh, festival days. And this is the biggest, this is Passover. So that's why he's in uh, in Jerusalem. He didn't even want to be there. And so he's already not real happy. Uh, and by the way, history tells us he's already had three different uh, uprisings, rebellions that he's had to squelch. And Rome, he, I mean, his job is on the line. He doesn't want any more problems. And so in verse 30, look at this. They answered him. If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Now, that's not a, that's not a clear accusation. They're saying, we, we've gotten to this point in the judicial system. They want him dead. But the Jews can't legally, can't kill him or, you know, come, come at him guilty of capital punishment. But the, but the Romans can. And now they've got something. And you're going to see it here. He claims to be a king. He has said that. He has a kingdom. And so if he's a king, there's only one king. It's Caesar, Tiberius at this point. And so Jesus is being accused. Notice he's delivered over to be our defense. 
The Jews did not deliver, not ultimately. He came into the world to be delivered. In fact, in our reading this week, you're reading through the book of Luke with us. All of us church members are doing this. And in our reading this week, we saw this. In Luke chapter nine, early on, he says, uh, the son of man will be delivered over to evil men. So he's running the show here. He, they're not delivering him. He, he is actually writing the narrative. It's why he came into the world. And so he becomes our defender. He's accused to become our advocate. And friends, listen, I just want to say it again. You and I need a defender like Jesus because he is our advocate. Because, and here it is, the accuser, you know this, Satan, literally the accuser, is constantly accusing you and me all the time and lying to us. Those thoughts that we have in our minds, the accuser is constantly bringing those thoughts into our minds that we're not worthy, we're not enough, you're not loved, you thought you were loved, you're not, you're not forgiven, you have a past, you, you, you're not the one that can, you're not good enough. Those are lies from the evil one. And they're coming at us constantly. He is the accuser. In fact, in Ephesians 6, verse 16, it describes his work as fiery darts. You know that passage? Fiery darts constantly coming at us. Fiery arrows, what are they? They're, they're temptations, but they're primarily lies that come into our head. And it generally has to do with who we claim to be, our identity. And if you're in Christ, your identity is shifted, right? And so it says, how do you ward off the, the, the fiery arrows? You remember that passage? The fiery darts coming at you, how do you ward it off? With the shield of what? Faith. Faith in what? Faith in God and who he is and what he has said about you. Faith in who you really are in him. Forgiven, righteous, loved, gifted. All the things. You know, your salvation is secure. Instead, when we listen to the evil one, we're not allowing the advocate, Jesus, to defend us against the lies of the evil one. So look at verse 31. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him. Wow, the irony. The judge of the universe. You judge him by your own law. He's basically saying, you guys take him. I don't want to deal with this guy. The Jews said to him, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. What? What? So Pilate is caught. Rome has a short temper and a shorter memory. He does not want to get caught in another rebellion, another riot. He wants to let Jesus go. He's trying to wash his hands, right, throughout this whole thing. You guys, he's basically like, y'all go kill him. Now think about this, gang. This is amazing. If, if he had let, let the Jews take him, the Jews did, not legally, but they did kill people. They did bring capital punishment upon people in their own, you know, their own law. And, and we see it through the Gospels. We're going to see it in, in Acts 8, where the first martyr of the church dies. Who was the first martyr of the church? Stephen. How was he killed? By stoning. The Jews killed by stoning. Jesus said, watch this, I will be lifted up. Not taken down. I'll be lifted up. And I'll draw all men to me. I had one commentator that I read said, if Jesus had been stoned to death, he would not be the Messiah. What? Jesus fulfilled every single hundreds of prophecies. And in, in Isaiah 53, it describes the Messiah dying by crucifixion. Watch this. Thousands of years before the Persians came up with it and the Romans perfected it. Jesus fulfills every prophecy in a single man because he is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah who was to come. He is going to be lifted up. He's not going to be taken down by the Jews. He's going to be crucified on a cross. He's accused in verse 29 to become our advocate. He's judged in verse 31 to become our justification. You see this? Have you ever been uh, accused of... Uh, of maybe maybe a false falsely accused of something that you did. You ever been falsely accused? One time I was station hour on this dream trip um, to Australia years ago, and I got pulled out of a line and taken into security because I had the same name of a guy they were looking for. 
And I had to prove that I was, and I'm not that guy. I had to, I had to prove, I, like I am, and it was not an easy thing to do. When you've been accused of something or, or people are claiming that you're something that is false, we, we need an advocate. I need, I was all by myself trying to, no, I'm not that guy. And friends, you and I need a defender. We need, we need an advocate. Have you allowed Jesus to be your defender? Or are you still trying to argue for your own self-righteousness? Because that won't play in the court of heaven. Because there's a problem. You're guilty. That's the problem. And you know this. Our defense attorneys know this. When, you're, when you have a defense attorney, um, they're going to tell you, just stay silent. Don't say a word. I will speak for you. In fact, especially if you're guilty, be quiet. I'll speak for you. This is what we do, friends. Listen, we stand before God Almighty. Someday, someday, you're going to stand before God Almighty. It's called the white throne judgment. And the only thing that we can offer is to say, I'm going to, I don't know if I have a right to remain silent, but I, whatever he says, I'm with Jesus. I got nothing. I'm going to let him be my advocate. And we do this every day, gang. This is how we live our lives. Many of us are living because the, the, in, in, in such turmoil, such anxiety, because we're trying to always measure up, always trying to advocate for ourselves, always trying to defend ourselves, always trying to justify ourselves. And that is a crushing way to live. And today is a day when you can be set free from this. Because here it is, gang. It's either going to be your righteousness or it's going to be what we call imputed righteousness. Christ's righteousness or your righteousness? Which will you choose? Accredited to you, his righteousness. He is your substitute. See, self-defense may be a really good thing in the physical world. In the spiritual world, it is deadly. And you can be free of this. This, again, sounds like a fantasy. Can you really live that way? And how do, how do you live that way? Well, we say it this way. Jesus said it. Die to yourself. What does that even mean? Die to your own desire to justify yourself. I mean, right at the heart of being a Christian is stop trying to validate yourself. Well, how do I do that? What do I, you, you allow your identity and your worth to be determined by Christ and to remain in it. It's his righteousness. It covers us and it's a constant battle because here's what a lot of us don't know. We, we say it this way. Jesus didn't come to make good people better. He came to bring dead people to life. Watch this. There are immoral dead people and there are moral dead people because none of us can be good enough. We need an advocate. We need a defender. So he defends us from accusation. Look at this. Secondly, we are defended from condemnation. Praise be to God. Look at this. Verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? So either, I think he's already heard this, but he steps out. He goes, he claims to be a king. Oh, wow. Maybe that's something. Let me go talk to this guy. He goes in. Jesus answered, do you say this on your own accord or what others have said about me? You parroting other people or do you? Here's what he's doing. Do he, this is the question he asked Peter and the disciples. It's his question that echoes into this room right now. Who do you say I am? That's what he's doing with Pilate. One commentator said, you want, he's basically, you want to follow me? Who do you say I am? And friends, that, the answer to that question, eternity weighs in the balance. Notice he doesn't say, hey, bring out your list of good works. How good are you? Hey, tell me how, how righteous you are. Just make the list. No. He says, who do you say I am? Because he's the great substitute. He's the only one who is righteous, right? He is the one. Is he Savior and Lord? of your life. Pilate in verse 35 answered, am I a Jew? Almost like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Your, your own nation, your chief priests have delivered you over to me. No, they haven't. What have you done? He says, what is it that you've, you've done? Now notice he's asking questions. Jesus has asked him questions because watch this in the courtroom, uh, the person in power is asking questions, right? And Pilate's going to end with a question. Jesus is interrogating him as he is by his spirit and in love interrogating us even today. 
That's what's happening here. But here's what's going on. And this is for some of us here. It's hard for people in power to submit to anyone. And for those of us in power, if you are in power, and that's all of us in varying degrees, if you're in a position of power, influence, if you have people that work under you, let me ask you, what does it look like to follow Jesus in your context? Maybe you have some, some, some wealth, more than most. It's all relative. What do you, how are you leveraging that? Because one in power who is following Jesus looks like Jesus, who empowers others, raises up others, gives to others, gives through the local church so that we can have ministries that take place, children's ministries and missions ministries and all the things that we're doing to care for the world and tell them about Jesus, right? So, so how are you leveraging your leadership? That's a question for some of us here. Look at verse 36. Because he's talking to a man of power here. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Think about this. Jesus has no defense. He's, he's advocating for himself because he doesn't need a defender. I mean, the only person, think about it, the only person trying to defend him was Peter's kind of swashbuckling antics, you know, in the garden, right? Like taking on a whole bunch of Roman soldiers. I mean, it's laughable because Jesus has no one to defend him because ultimately he doesn't need one to defend him. See, he became defenseless to become our defender, right? We stand defenseless before God, friends. It's why we need to constantly just die to ourselves. And, and we, we've set up our own kingdoms that, that while they may not be a threat to God, still are insurrections up against his rightful, holy rule over our lives. And we do it all the time. I'll be king this week. I'll be king in this moment. Instead of dying to ourselves and, and allowing Jesus, who, who's who comes, he lives the perfect life for us. He's buried, he dies, and he's raised again so that he would take on our condemnation. And here's a word for some of us here, gang. This is a big problem for a lot of us. Self-condemnation needs to end in your life. That's the core application, I think, of this message for a lot of us. Romans 8, 1. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you, let's go, how many of you are are in Christ Jesus. How many of you, like me, are in Christ Jesus? Raise your hand. Like you ought to be going, yes, praise be to God. Okay, if you are. If you're in him, watch this. Now, everybody say now. Now, there's no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, self-condemnation needs to end in your life. The stuff that you keep telling yourself that you're not worthy, you're not enough, you're, you're not good enough, your past can't be forgotten or forgiven. You're not defined by your past, you're defined by Jesus' past. And his past is perfect. But listen, if you're not in Christ, and you're like, I don't know, I don't, I'm, I don't know if I'm a believer. If you're not in Christ, you're condemned already. Like being a Christian, being forgiven, that's not default mode. The default is you're already condemned. You're already, the Bible says you're already condemned in your sin. You need rescue. You're living a self-righteous, self-justified life, and it's not going to play in the court of heaven. And it's going to ruin you in this life. And so finally, here's the last one. We are defended from deception. We're defended from accusation, from condemnation. And this is so big. We're, we're, we're freed up from deception. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Because he didn't, he didn't say he wasn't. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. And in, in, in essence, you have no idea what kind of king I am. You, you can say I am. For this purpose, I, I was born. For this purpose, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What kind of political leader has no aspiration for power? The kind that brings change through the truth. The kind who is the truth, who embodies truth, right? 
He is the truth. And then Pilate asked this question, what is truth? And y'all, that's not a ridiculous question. Think about it. This is the question of our day. This is the question in the secular age. What is truth? And we have seen a major shift over the past five, 10 years. In, in 2016, you might remember the word of the year that Oxford Dictionary chose, the word they do every year, was post-truth. A tipping point that we now live in a post-truth culture, which by definition is a post-Christian culture. We've talked about this a lot, that now your truth is it's kind of like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. It's your preference up against my preference, what you think it is, what your, your truth as if there is your truth instead of objective, ultimate truth that we find in God, in his word, and watch this, embodied in the person of Jesus. And so now we, it's been twisted because watch this. The question is, pro, Jesus is not answering the question for a lot of reasons, but maybe it's the wrong question. Who is the truth is the question. And he's standing right in front of him. Look at John 14, 6. You all know this. Let's say it together. I am the way, then the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way. He's the means. He is the truth. Friends, listen. You and I, we live in a world where we have got to determine what the truth is. And praise be to God, we have the truth. We have God, we have the person of Jesus, we can be in his word every day. And, and parents, we've got to be teaching our kids what the truth is. And I'm not a fear monger, I'm not afraid. But I know this, here I'm a little, little grand, granddaughter, grandson. If they don't know the truth, they're not gonna survive in this world. They're not gonna make it spiritually. It's why we're devoted to teaching our children, the next generation, the truth. Because truth nowadays has been weaponized as a means towards a predetermined personal or social end. You know this. And, this, and we often play this out politically, and that's not what I'm going to do here. But we know that like, it's twisted. Think about this. Sex change surgery is now gender affirming care. If you want to advocate for biblical marriage, you're homophobic. That's the truth. That's the other. There's truth. You have truth. I've got truth, right? Defend the unborn. It's a war on women. I mean, we want to advocate for women. We want to eliminate every reason that someone would need an abortion. Because we're, we're pro-life, not just anti-abortion, some of us, Right? Instead, we know we want to, to, to bring the truth. And then, and then on the other side, if you will, if we, if we fight for social or biblical justice, then you're woke. Like everything I disagree with is woke. We, must, we, we need to be the most woke people on the planet, awakened to the needs of other people. I don't know, that's not what it means. It's been hijacked. I get that. Uh, how about this? If you don't believe that women should have to compete against biological men in sports, okay, certain sports in particular, uh, you're transphobic. It's been twisted, gang. And I know it's, this is not, I know, just in a moment in a sermon, these are challenging issues. And we must approach them with grace and love, but we've got to stand for the truth. Amen. Because in my lifetime, we've never seen this kind of epistemology in America. Where now there's no truth. It's your truth up against that truth, up against that. But here's the thing we, we need to hear today. His truth, it doesn't constrain us. This is what people don't understand, but we can, we can set people free. You need to be set free today. His, his truth sets us free. He says, you're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But free from what? Pride. Self-justification, self-validation. Pilate is asking the question of our generation. He's asking the question. And so now as I start to land the plane here, I want you to hear this from 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. An older apostle John now says this, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that for this purpose, you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, he 
uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Think about this. You ever wonder, what is Jesus doing now? He's finished everything. He died on the cross for us. He's completed what's necessary for our justification. The atonement has taken place for all who would receive it. And you must receive it. If you want to be saved. If you want to live not trying to justify yourself. But look at this. Who is he advocating for? The text tells us. Anyone. And watch this. Anyone who sins. Anybody? Anybody? Anyone who sins. Okay. He's an advocate for us. Why is he an advocate? He tells us. He's righteous. That's why. He alone is righteous. Standing for a holy God on our behalf. Because we can't. We're guilty. We are fallen sinful people. Jesus steps in as our substitute. The righteous one defends us. He's advocating for us even right now. How is it that he's able to be the one and only advocate? He's righteous. But look at this. The next verse he explains. He is the propitiation. Okay. The substitute. The wrath satisfier for our sins. And not for ours only. But also for all the sins of the whole wide world. Anyone who would receive his gift of grace. The fact that he died on the cross for our sins. And again, as fallen human beings, we are born self-advocates. And we've got to constantly fight against that. But friends, listen. What if, oh, this is it. What if, what if we never needed an advocate ever again? What if we never, ever needed someone or ourselves, how about that? We, need, we never needed to fight for ourselves again. We never had to advocate for our, our righteousness is what we're doing. Did I, I'm actually right. I'm not as bad as you think I am. I'm going to argue my point. What if, we were, what if we didn't have to do that anymore? What if, no more blame shifting to other people. No more, well, it's your fault. Because I'm right again. What if we, we, we didn't have to live that way anymore? What if we could end the tiring, crushing demands of self-justification? Well, we would be free. We would be living with peace, a gospel of peace and a freedom that says, I, I know I'm messed up, but I've got Jesus standing for me. Dane Ortland wrote a book that some of you have read. It's called Gentle and Lowly. I commend you to it. Our whole staff's reading it right now. And in it, and I'll close our time towards decision and and response. In it, he notes that Paul Bunyan wrote a book on a singular verse, because that's how we did it back then. And the verse is, is Hebrews 7. Look at this. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What is Jesus doing right now? He's interceding on your behalf. He's advocating for you. But it's not like he's trying to convince the father. Hey, no, really, I died on the cross for this person. Like, no, for real. What he's doing is he's reminding the spirit. The spirit is constantly reminding us of what Christ has already done. Because we're prone to forget, right? Ortland puts it this way. Justification is tied to what Christ did in the past. Intercession is what he's doing in the present. His intercession for us is tied. It's like hitting a refresh on the justification that's already taking place in your life. If... You're in him. If you're not, again, you're already condemned. And you need to receive Christ today. Eternity weighs in the balance for you, friends, because you're going to stand before God Almighty. And the reason that he's advocating for us in heaven is because we continue to sin here on earth. And you will not be able to stand before God on judgment day and say, let me pull out my list of things that I've done. And I hope the scales lean in my favor. It's not going to happen. You need to die to yourself and you need to give your life to him. And so we're going to close our time in a really special way. And I want us to, let's just do this. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and I'll explain how we're going to do this. If you would just pray, the band's coming up because we're going to sing a song, really a song over you. We have time to do this and, and you're going to respond. We're going to move here. In fact, in a moment, I'm asking all of us to be a part of this. First of all, if you've never received Christ, I want, I want to challenge you to do that now. The invitation, not from me, not from a pastor, is from Jesus himself. He says, come. 
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest from your self-justification. Friends, it sounds like fantasy. You can live this way. So what is he saying to you? Or how about this? Of all the lies that you're prone to, prone to believe, that all the lies that you hear all the time, maybe, maybe it comes out of your past, maybe it's just your need to just perform or to gain the approval of the people. What is the lie that you're most prone to run to? Think about that. You're not enough. You're unworthy. You're not lovable. You're not, you're not handsome enough, pretty enough. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. Your past has disqualified you. You're not. You're not. And I want you to hear the word of God. What is the Spirit saying to you in response to that? Listen to what he says about you, the only voice that matters, the ultimate judge. He says you're loved. You are forgiven. You're the one he loves. The real you, not, not the one you're hiding from everybody else. He loves you. In fact, his love for you. Listen, your sin triggers his love even more so for you. That's what he does. He does. 